in addition to a lot of great talks, we've had two Olympic athletes. Uh, John had some great slides to keep everybody entertained. And uh, Charlie and John Bell both had some uh, great historical stuff. You learned all about Hippocrates and got to see Winston Churchill. So I'm standing up here trying to figure out how I'm going to compete with that. Um, and actually, I was, as I was watching the party tricks, it occurred to me that you know, before I moved up to New Hampshire, I was working in Florida. And I was actually a physician for the Ringling Brothers Circus. And <laughs> talk about party tricks. My second year in practice, I had twin sisters who were coming in to see me. And my assistant in the office said, you got to come see this. And I walk out, and I look in the waiting room. And they've cleared all the chairs aside. And they're entertaining everybody waiting in the office, doing a tumbling act. And as I'm watching this, the shoulders are everywhere. The arms are across the head. The right shoulder's out in the front. The left one's out the back. Then it's the other way around. And I'm watching this, and I can't believe it. So sure enough, they bring the patient in the room. And I walk in, and I said, so tell me about your shoulder troubles. She looked at me like I was nuts. She said, I'm here for my knee. Um, <laughs> So that's, the party tricks really do work in the right patients, in the right people. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the mechanics of throwing. Um, how many people here have been or are overhand athletes? Because throwing, when we talk about it, really can be anything from baseball pitching, volleyball, tennis, javelin. So a fair number. Coaches or parents of kids playing Little League. So. Um, Conceptually, what we want to talk about is the mechanics of throwing, and it certainly ties into everything you've heard tonight about rotator cuff injuries and uh, instability, labral injuries. So when we talk about throwing, we're talking about all of these athletes. And, and most of these concepts apply regardless. But the easy, obvious uh, sport to pick is, is throwing, it is uh, baseball, and it's actually pitching. That's where a lot of this data comes from and a lot of the information comes from. So when we talk about throwing, any sort of overhand throwing motion puts an extreme amount of demand on the shoulder. Um, you're talking about a tremendous amount of acceleration over a short period of time and then a rapid deceleration while at the same time trying to maintain control and produce velocity. That repetitive movement, movement as you've heard, can stretch out the tissues. You can have acute injuries, but a lot of times we see a lot of these cumulative issues of instability or rotator cuff problems that have to do a lot with not only structural issues, but mechanics of throwing. So we know that although we see a lot of abdominal, abdominal injuries, groin injuries, back pain, still the most common thing we see in repetitive overhand athletes is uh, shoulder or elbow difficulties. We know that in pitching, velocity and accuracy are the two factors that make throwers or pitchers in this case most productive. Accuracy, we still really don't understand the mechanics of accuracy. You can, you can make some assumptions about things, but we know about velocity and we know about repetitive stress. So when we talk about this, what really I wanted to emphasize tonight, because a lot of these things that you hear about in the shoulder are clearly shoulder problems but they are often related to the overall mechanics of the throwing motion or the overhand motion. The concept that has been popularized over the last 10 years is something that we like to call the kinetic chain of activity. And what that really means is that this isn't just about your shoulder. When you throw a ball, you're not standing there doing this. That's how young kids start out, but they gradually learn. You've got to rotate your trunk. You've got to turn your hips. You've got to put your feet in a certain position and rotate your body. So we call this a kinetic chain of activity that begins with the lower body and transfers to the upper body. Studies that have been done over the years have now shown that the velocity that you can generate with a throw correlates with the push-off force of the leg, in the, obviously in the direction that you're throwing. And that push-off force provides the initial momentum to the body to generate that velocity. The lead leg is actually the source of energy transfer. As that foot comes down, the energy is now being transferred up the chain, up the body. 
interestingly, you don't pay much attention to it, but when you see these pictures with that leg up here, that lead knee has to be at a certain position in order to maintain pelvic stability and trunk stability to generate all of this transmission of energy into the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, and then the ball release. So as we look at this, we go from that foot and the knee up to the pelvis and the trunk because all of these rotations and movements have to be coordinated in a, in a fashion that allows an efficient transfer of that energy. We know that the power is then channeled from that energy up through the shoulder and the elbow, as I said. So you've learned about anatomy. We talk about the muscles being dynamic stabilizers, and you've seen most of these. You know, it's not just the rotator cuff, it's not just the deltoid, but there are all these other muscles that Chris and others have talked about in terms of the rhomboid, the trap muscles, what's called the levator scapulae. Somebody mentioned the serratus anterior before, your pec muscle. All of these muscles have to not only work, but they have to work in coordination with each other, and they have to be, work in balance. So we're looking from the back, again, here are these muscles. We look again at the trapezius, that infraspinatus muscle in the back, the teres minor, the other part of the rotator cuff in the back, the deltoid, the trap, the rhomboids, and again, the serratus anterior, I don't think you see in this picture, but again, all these play a role at different points in the shoulder movement, again, and we're talking about energy transfer, but all of these muscles have to work in coordination at the level of the shoulder to coordinate and keep that scapula, that shoulder blade, in position to maintain that ball in the socket at all times and prov produce the efficiency of the throw. So you've seen some of these pictures before, and I, I don't want to belabor all the details, but at different positions of shoulder movement, different parts of those ligaments in that capsule that, that you've heard about in instability have to tension and tighten at various points of that arm movement. So certain parts of that capsule and those ligaments which really blend and are part of that capsule have to tighten or loosen at different times depending upon the arm position. So when we talk about throwing, you're really talking about phases of throwing in which there's different levels of muscle activity. We go from wind up to what's called an early cocking phase, the late cocking, acceleration, deceleration, and then follow through. So how do you define those things? Well, people have looked at this in, in the, the muscle mechanics. We talk about wind up as the start of the motion up to the point where that non-dominant hand, if you're a right-handed thrower, that left hand leaves the ball, comes out of the glove. The early cocking goes from that point until that front lead foot lands on the ground. And then at late cocking, so now your arm is way back here, you've got maximum humeral external rotation. So that shoulder, that upper arm is turned way back. And if you look at some of these pitchers who generate tremendous velocity, I can't get my arm as far back as those people do. Acceleration then occurs from that point on maximum rotation through here right to the ball release, and then the deceleration is really the first one-third of the time after the ball release before the arm starts, stops uh, at the follow-through. The wind-up, not significant muscle activity in the sense that we're talking about here, but in that cocking phase, again, you've got the maximum external rotation of the shoulder, maximum anterior force. Anterior is the front. So as you're out here, something's got to be working in front as well as in back, but there's a tremendous amount of force trying to push that ball out the front of the socket. You've got a lot of torque at both the shoulder and the elbow as well. So you have to play into all these mechanics, and somebody I think is going to talk a little bit later about the elbow in this uh, series of events too. But again, you don't have to worry about all the detail, but in that early cocking phase, the arm is out here and it's beginning to reach that external rotation but hasn't hit the maximum external rotation. But those scapular muscles, that rhomboid, the trap, those surrounding muscles around the shoulder blade have to help move. Again, remember that shoulder blade is the same bone that has the socket. So it is your socket. And that shoulder blade has to move in coordination to keep that ball positioned and give what we call, like to call a stable platform for that ball to rotate in the socket. The deltoid muscle works with that supraspinatus tendon to help elevate the arm up. Um, and then as we go through this, again, here are those muscles we're talking about that have to work at this phase 
and then we get to the late cocking phase where you have that maximum external rotation. The muscles in the front of the shoulder, that subscapularis tendon, the front part of the rotator cuff has to help restrain the, the ball from slipping out the front. Your pec is actually active in there, the pectoralis muscle. The lats have to work. All of these muscles in addition to these ligaments that you see in the front, what we call the glenohumeral ligaments. There's inferior in the front, middle, and usually superior glenohumeral ligaments, all of which, again, at different phases have to work to help hold that ball in place along with these other dynamic stabilizers. When we get to the late cocking phase, so now you're maximally rotated back here, that infraspinatus muscle, the teres minor, those parts of the rotator cuff in the back are helping stabilize the shoulder and bring that arm back. You're trying to restrain that anterior movement, that front movement of the shoulder again. So again, think about it in all these phases, what it does to that capsule, those ligaments that we're talking about that you heard about in instability, if you're doing this over and over again. The scapulothoracic muscles, again, the rhomboid, the trap, some of these other surrounding muscles have to work in coordination to retract and protract. So move that shoulder blade out and pull it back. And you see here, you know, with, with the movement of that shoulder blade moving in, the trapezius muscle, the rhomboids, and smaller muscle called the levator scapulae have to work. Going the other way is that serratus anterior that was mentioned earlier. And they, again, have to tip that scapula and move it to keep the humeral head centered. And then you get to acceleration. And if you look at this, you're talking about movement from that maximally externally rotated position to internal rotation, a 100 degree arc at a minimum in most cases in less than five one hundredths of a second. So you're talking about a huge amount of what in physics like to call angular velocity, puts a tremendous amount of torque on the shoulder. At points in the movement, you have torque on the elbow. And then the compression forces to maintain that ball in the socket as you're rapidly accelerating through that. The deltoid, the supraspinatus, and other structures are helping to support this. The pec and the teres minor, again in the back, help to balance those muscles out to keep the ball centered in the socket. And you've got significant activity in all these muscles, the subscap, the lat, the pec. Uh, to maintain that stability, maintain that platform so that you don't stretch out those ligaments and put added stress, potentially tear a structure or again with repeated use, stretch them out considerably. Um, at that phase of ball release, you've got now a combination of the shoulder position and then as you release, there's that lateral tilting of the upper body to create the arm slot. And as you can imagine, if you change that arm slot, you're going to change the stress and the torque on both the shoulder and the elbow, which can lead to injuries. So again, you're looking at things mechanically that, as an orthopedic surgeon, I've done enough of this that I can recognize certain things, but I'm not a pitching coach. I can't sit there and analyze the mechanics. But if we look at it from this context, if you took a video of these pitchers, you can almost be assured that the ones who are developing shoulder and elbow problems have issues with their mechanics. Their arm slot may be different. Certainly if they've had injuries, they have a tendency to drop that arm, lead with the elbow, and put added stress on the elbow. If they've had elbow problems, they may change their trunk rotation and cause shoulder problems. So all of that important as parents, coaches, just to be aware of and make sure that we're teaching our kids proper mechanics. As the arm decelerates, you now have to release that energy and the muscles contract in what we call an eccentric fashion to try to decelerate the shoulder. So again, these posterior muscles behind the shoulder, the teres minor, really trying to help slow things down. Your pec works, your subscap, your, your lats to really try to, again, maintain that stability as you're now decelerating rapidly. At that stage, you're putting a tremendous amount of force across both the shoulder and the elbow as well. So again, if mechanics are off, it doesn't take much. Like driving your car with the wheels out of alignment, you're going to wear something down. Again, the follow through here, serratus anterior is active. So how do you tie all this together? Well, the bottom line is you can look at injury prevention and performance enhancement, and they go hand in hand. Just as you heard from Sarah earlier, you know, training is 
a huge part of this. And proper training is going to prevent injuries. It's not only going to improve performance, but it's going to prevent these injuries if you have the right mechanics, you develop the right muscles, you don't have muscle imbalances. The muscles in the front of the shoulder are stronger or weaker than the muscles in the back. You have to have that balance because this is a major uh, kinetic coordinated activity of different body parts here and different muscles. So we know obviously high forces and torques applied repeatedly can cause injury. Most of you, if you are sports fans or watch ESPN these days, because Jim Andrews gets more PR on ESPN than any orthopedic surgeon I know, but Jim Andrews has made a name for himself, rightfully so, treating a lot of high-level professional athletes, and he's done a lot of research along with his colleagues on sho shoulder and throwing mechanics. And one of the things that's come out of uh, some of the research, they talk about how do the mechanics outside the shoulder joint affect shoulder and elbow injury potential. Improper lead foot mechanics and pelvis rotation produce additional anterior shoulder force and medial elbow force. What does that mean? It means if you're striding and you're, if you're a right-handed thrower and that left foot is landing and it's not pointed in the right direction, it's pointed too far to first base, you're going to put added stress because of the way your body has to compensate to put added stress on the shoulder and then the elbow. If your pelvis is tight and it's not rotating well, something else has to accommodate for that. Often it's your arm slot and the shoulder and the elbow are going to see more stress, you're going to be more predisposed to injuries. The timing of shoulder rotation is important. That's where the coaching comes in. If the arm's not in the correct position, when you're ready to release the ball, again, you're leading with the elbow, the shoulder is lagging behind, or vice versa, you can have a real problem. I won't put you through the pain of going through this whole chart, but this is in that handout. And it just is a nice reminder of what the proper mechanics should look like and what the consequences are if the mechanics are off. And so these are things that, whether you're doing this yourself or whether you have kids who are in Little League, you can look at some of these things and at least it helps uh, to provide a little bit of a guideline of what to look for and maybe to talk to coaches about, if, if, especially if the kids are, are going into a serious throwing program. So this takes you through just each, each of the phases of the throwing motion. And again, a lot of this does apply to other sports. The same muscles, the same ligaments are involved. The mechanics can be slightly different, but there's not a colossal difference between the pitching motion and other overhand sporting movements. So there's another piece that we look at, and again, Jim Andrews and his colleagues have come out with a lot of data on this. Um, what about the young athletes? Well, some of the studies that are out there have shown the risk of pain with throwing increases if they're throwing more than 75 pitches per game. And again, we're talking about that little league age. Pitchers who averaged more than 80 pitches per game were shown to be four times more likely to require surgery ultimately. And if they didn't take downtime during the course of the year, they're playing that same sport and particularly pitching for eight months out of the year, five times more likely to need surgery. And these are young kids up to teenage high school level. So, I mean, that's a lot to go through, you know, and a lot of these kids, if they need surgery, it's hard to come back, it's certainly hard to come back and pitch. So what are the recommendations? Get the mechanics down. Start young, learning how to throw properly. If you're going to be a pitcher, get the kids to master the fastball first. Understand the mechanics of the proper throwing technique. Moving to a changeup still, not so much more stress on the shoulder or the elbow. Curveball can wait. Mechanically speaking, some of the latest data shows that there may not be significantly more stress throwing a curveball than a fastball, but still just because of skeletal development, I think it's still a good idea to wait at least until they're age 14 and have mastered a decent throwing technique before you go on and start learning to throw a curveball. So just in summary, obviously knowledge of mechanics is going to improve performance but also prevent injury. Young athletes need to progress slowly along a sequence to understand the coordinated movements and understand, again, in some fashion, this kinetic chain so that they minimize the stress. 
Again, you'll see this in the handout, but added stress simply by having that lead foot in the wrong position, shoulder rotation not right, pelvis and upper trunk tight or not rotating properly, and the shoulder position at ball release. Um, strengthening, the, strengthening of the shoulder muscles, as we talked about and we focused on, that's just one piece of the puzzle. Clearly, you need to do a proper shoulder strengthening program if you're going to be a swimmer or any sort of overhand athlete and a pitcher, but that's one piece of the puzzle. Core strength, abdominal muscles, pelvic trunk stability, leg strength, hip strength, muscle balance, all important key factors in order to reduce mechanical stress. So thanks for inviting me. <laughs>